In response to labor shortages, Wisconsin's state Senate decided to vote in favor of a bill that would loosen child labor regulations in their state, which would allow children as young as 14 years old to work late into the night. Insider reports that Wisconsin currently sticks to federal child labor laws, which stipulate that people under the age of 16 can only work between 7 a.m. and 9 p.m., from June 1st to Labor Day, and between 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. for the rest of the year. But in an effort to increase the pool of labor in the state uh, because of the so-called great resignation, uh, the lawmakers in Wisconsin are trying to do these companies in the state a solid by making it making minors available to work uh, later into the night. So Wisconsin Senate approved a bill that would allow 14 and 15 year olds to work from 6 a.m. to 9.30 p.m. on days before a school day and 6 a.m. to 11 p.m. when the next day is not a school day. The bill would keep in place federal rules limiting teens to three hours of work on a school day, eight hours on non-school days and six days a week of work, which is insane. I, I just think that you're 14 years old. Uh, you shouldn't be working six days a week. Uh, and I don't think you should be working late into the night. Now, the hotel and tourism industry uh, and its lobbyists are, of course, very much in favor of uh, what the Senate passed. And to be clear, it has not been signed into law in Wisconsin. We're just talking about this passing in the state Senate. But also, the AFL-CIO, um, a federation of unions, uh, says we absolutely should not be loosening these child labor laws. This is insane. And the AFL is important here. Uh, you should keep the a AFL in mind as I do this segment because they were really the first to draw attention to the problem of child labor back in the 1880s. Now, more on that later in the segment. And while loosening child labor regulation sounds uh, pretty insane, Wisconsin is not the only state that's turning to kids to fill jobs. Uh, a McDonald's in Medford, Oregon, um, has started advertising its willingness to hire children as young as 14 and 15 years old. And what made children so appealing uh, was that, you know, they were exploited for labor during the Industrial Revolution. And the fact they were exploited um, or the fact that they were able to work um, allowed for these uh, company owners to essentially pay them far less than they pay adult workers. Uh, that is something that's unfortunately being practiced even today. So minors get even less wage protection since they fall into a different category of workers. I'm not talking about back in the day. It was also true back in the day. I'm also talking about today. The way the regulations are written on a federal level are a little problematic because workers under the age of 20 can be paid as little as $4.25 an hour for up to 90 days of what they refer to as training. So they're working they're doing exactly the same job they do past the 90 days. But since they're training, the way the law is written uh, allows these companies to pay uh, the underage workers far less, $4.25 an hour. If a state has a higher minimum wage, that would supersede the minor wage. Now, if we're specifically looking at a state like Wisconsin, what does that mean? Well, Wisconsin's minimum wage is tied to the federal minimum wage rate. A special minimum wage of $5.90 per hour and $2.13 per hour for tipped employees is applicable to opportunity employees, I love the way that they phrase that, under 20 years old who have worked for less than 90 days with their current employer. That's problematic enough, but when you think about the fact that lobbyists right now basically control any and all legislation, it's kind of terrifying to think about, you know, the potential of these lobbyists paying these politicians in the form of legalized bribes to further loosen those restrictions, right? Because they can be paid that uh, smaller wage for up to 90 days, but there's no rule indicating that lobbyists are banned from lobbying our lawmakers to increase that threshold from like 90 days to like three years if they want. So that's something that I'm a little bit concerned about, to say the least. But Wisconsin's attempt to loosen child labor regulations is not an isolated case either. We've seen other instances. So, for instance, you have former Republican congressman and Speaker of the House, Newt Gingrich, 
who was notorious for making statements that suggested child labor laws were nonsensical and that they needed to be repealed. In fact, here's a particularly awful argument he made in favor of firing adult janitors to replace them with school-aged workers. The core policies of protecting unionization and bureaucratization against children in the poorest neighborhoods, crippling them by putting them in schools that fail, has done more to create income inequality in the United States than any other single policy. It is tragic what we do in the poorest neighborhoods in trapping children in, first of all, in child laws, which are truly stupid. Okay, you say to somebody, you shouldn't go to work before you're what, 14, 16 years of age, fine. You're totally poor. You're in, a, you're in a school that is failing with a teacher that's failing. I tried for years to have a very simple model. Most of these schools ought to get rid of the unionized janitors, have one master janitor, and pay local students to take care of the school. I mean, it's just absolutely absurd, right? Rather than take a look at the problem of child poverty in the country, Newt Gingrich's solution, by the way, in the richest country in the world, was not to make these children whole, was not to really take a step back and look at the way our system is structured uh, that puts these people in a disadvantage. His solution is, why don't we just put them to work? Why don't we put children to work? But of course, we got to fire the unionized janitors first. I mean, it just gives you a sense of the kind of thinking you see, not just from the Republican Party. We see similar thinking from liberals as well these days who are far more interested in arguments regarding fiscal responsibility rather than um, really having a discussion about redistributing wealth. Now, in order to fully understand, to really understand how devastating rolling back child labor laws would be, we have to remember how brutal the practice was, and how much workers had to sacrifice just to end the practice. In fact, a 1933 article in The Nation titled Children on Strike described the horrifying working conditions for children in Pennsylvania specifically. Obviously, there were incredibly long hours. One boy said he worked from 7 a.m. until 5 p.m. and then returned to the factory three nights each week to work from 7 p.m. to 3 a.m., Others told of being ordered to hide in the cellar and on fire escapes when state inspectors came to the mill. Their pay was ridiculously low already, with wages being uh, deducted by bosses who had fees, taxes, and other fines to pay. For instance, 14-year-old Martin Crowbuth, uh, a trimmer, explained um, how the Dashevsky brothers saved the two-cent check tax by assessing each employee. The boy said his last check for six days work was 96 cents, but he did not get all of that. An additional 10% was uh, deducted as a wage cut together with the two cents for the check tax. Uh, there was another example given. Another Allentown employer developed an even better system. He deducted 33 cents a week from the pay envelopes of each child to repay a fine of $100 assessed by the state for his failure to carry workman's compensation insurance. Um, Frank Selfoffer, uh, considered the fastest trimmer in the plant, received $1.73 for two weeks of work. And of course, uh, children at the time were uh, coerced and even raped by their bosses. A uh, Titian haired girl receiving 55 cents a week said the mill superintendent offered her uh, a 100% wage increase if she would accept his attentions at least three times weekly. Others, mere children, told of being taken to New York hotels for weekends as playthings for the owners of the factories and for the purpose of enticing buyers to purchase shirts made in their mills. I mean, just absolutely horrific stories, horrific stories that were told, um, not just in this piece, but in um, activist groups at the time who were trying to end the practice. So as the title of the Nation article notes, the children went on strike to improve their working conditions, despite the risks associated with standing up to their bosses. So Hale A. Gus, borough manager of Northampton, told the governor's commission that either Harry or Nathan Dashevsky, uh, who operate one of the world's uh, sweatshops, or the worst, I should say, sweatshops in the Lee Valley, Lehigh Valley, the D&D &D shirt company suggested having a gun planted 
on a union organizer. Another state official, a woman said that one of the Dashevskys um, asked her why he couldn't have National Guardsmen to protect his mill against the baby strikers, as they were referred to. Why, she asked. Aren't the police sufficient protection? Yes, he said, but they won't fight. He wanted to call in National Guardsmen to fight children who were striking as a result of their awful, horrific working conditions. But today, think tanks and right-wing organizations try to launder the true ugliness of child labor, hoping to propagandize Americans into thinking the brutality of that practice was anything but. Here's a video from Learn Liberty's uh, YouTube channel doing just that. Are we doing something wrong by buying the products made with her labor? I'm Benjamin Powell. I direct the Free Market Institute at Texas Tech University, where I'm also an economics professor. I've spent over a decade studying sweatshops and child labor in poorer countries around the world. We feel bad when we buy products made with child labor. But most children who work in poorer countries don't work making us products. They work in agriculture or household services. It's only a small minority that work in manufacturing, and those manufacturing jobs tend to pay better than working in agriculture or services, and in the case of agriculture, injury rates are higher for children. When we stop buying products made with child labor, it doesn't cure their poverty, it just pushes more children into these other less desirable sectors of their economy. Yeah, child labor is great. I mean, we're doing them a solid by making sure that they're manufacturing our products so we can you know, consume them as cheaply as possible here in the United States. I mean, absolutely disgusting argument. But the most laughable part about Learn Liberty's video was the revisionist history that was uh, implemented in regard to the United States and its practice of child labor. Now, pay close attention to how he claims child labor ended in the country. Many people think child labor doesn't exist because we have laws against it today. But when we were as poor as these countries are in the third world, we didn't have laws against child labor and the laws we had weren't restrictions at all. It wasn't until 1938 that we had our first national anti-child labor law here in the United States. By then, our incomes were up over $10,000 per person in today's terms. But when we look around the world today, countries that have incomes of $10,000 don't have any child labor anyway. Children don't work because their parents are mean or stupid. They work because they're desperately poor and they need the meager income from the child to feed and clothe the family. As the process of economic development happens, incomes go up and children cease working. And then only later do countries adopt laws that prohibit child labor. The real cure for child labor is adopting institutions that support economic freedom, private property rights, and the rule of law. When that happens, the process of economic development occurs and child labor is ended all on its own. I mean, I, I don't think you guys need me to explain how much of a garbage argument that really was, right? This this idea that, no, no, we, I mean, these wonderful uh, corporations, these wonderful companies, these executives, um, you know, just didn't need to pay children anymore because there was so much wealth to go around. Now, as we know, capitalism is a system that uh, seeks to maximize profit. And in order to maximize profit, you got to definitely treat your workers pretty horrifically. That means lowering their pay, uh, putting them in awful working conditions, and yes, finding people who will work for the cheapest uh, wage possible. And that's why they took advantage of children. It wasn't uh, because of a lack of wealth to go around. It's complete nonsense. In fact, considering the baby strikers referenced earlier, child labor didn't just go away all on, on its own here in the United States. Much like all federal workplace regulations, protecting children from a system of exploitation and profit seeking had to be fought by the workers. So in it actually took decades of labor activity and strikes to make that happen. Progressive reformers became alarmed at the growing number of child workers. They formed organizations in the early 1900s devoted to the healthy development of children. One of those organizations, the National Child Labor Committee, hired Lewis Wicks Hine to photograph children at work and to expose their harsh conditions. Hines' images brought national attention to the difficult life of millions of children. Over the next 20 years, the NCLC and other organizations investigated child labor abuses and continued to push for state legislation that would take children out of the workforce and put them in schools. 
Finally, by 1929, every state had restrictions preventing children under 14 from working. Now, obviously, those are state level regulations that in some cases did not go far enough, especially in southern states that relied on child labor for cotton picking. Uh, here is a video explaining that in more detail. National legislation against child labor would take another decade because business and industry continued to oppose it. In fact, one of the major reasons that national legislation about child labor didn't make it past the Supreme Court until 1938, I mean, it's unbelievable to us that there was no federal legislation against child labor until almost 1940, was because essentially the Southern cotton interests and Midwestern coal, iron, steel interests combined to fight this legislation to stop child labor. In 1938, President Franklin D. Roosevelt signed the Fair Labor Standards Act, which restricted child labor and continues to protect workers to this day. So 1938, FDR passes uh, federal regulations that impact child labor, child labor practices. But even that video doesn't really give you the whole story. FDR didn't just do this out of the kindness of his own heart. He was pressured to do it. And there was a great deal of labor activity uh, that made that happen. The first move, in fact, to end uh, the practice of child labor in the United States was made by the American Federation of Labor in 1881. So just think about the time span here. Uh, 1881, the a AFL uh, decides to uh, pass a re resolution regarding child labor uh, during one of their meetings. And then uh, it takes literally decades until 1938 for anything to be done on a federal level. So as I mentioned, the AFL uh, passed a resolution calling on states to ban, just completely ban children under the age of 14 from all gainful employment. And uh, this did kick off protests and strikes. Uh, in fact, uh, one of the strikes that I'm gonna talk about in just a little, uh, little bit has to do with Mother Jones, uh, but take a look at workers uh, staging strikes and demonstrations uh, in order to do something about child labor. Individual workers and social reformers in the 1800s and 1900s fought against child labor, dangerous working conditions, long hours and bad wages, but they had little power until labor unions were formed. Striking was an effective bargaining tool but going on strike was not just a parade. It was more like a rebellion and the situation could be terrifying and dangerous. Local and national governments treated strikes as civil unrest and often dispatched armed troops to break them up. Workers were injured and many died as they clashed with police and National Guard. Unions worked very hard to demand legislation that brought about an end to child labor in this country. Unions over the years have fought for legislation to protect workers on the job, but also to protect the living conditions and living standards of working people. Yeah, it seems like uh, this narrative kind of conflicts with what we heard from our little Texas professor who claimed that, you know, all of a sudden things changed out of the kindness of corporations' hearts. That's not how it worked. Uh, these strikes put a lot on the line for workers. They did uh, sacrifice quite a bit to change uh, the regulations to ensure that there was uh, workplace protections, not only for children, but for workers overall. In fact, one of the pivotal moments um, in the fight to end child labor was the so-called March of the Mill Children in 1903, which was led by Mother Jones. On July 5th, Mother Jones approached the strike leaders with a plan to march from Kensington, Pennsylvania to Oyster Bay, New York, the summer home of President Theodore Roosevelt. She hoped to take a group of mill children with her to raise public awareness of child labor and gain financial support for the Kensington strikers. On July 7th, the March of the Mill Children began with fifes and drums playing a stirring marching tune and strikers carrying banners reading, we are textile workers and 55 hours or nothing. On July 26th, the marchers were invited to visit Coney Island by the owner of the wild animal show there, Mr. Frank Bostock. He allowed Mother Jones to take control of his show. She even went so far as to place some of the children in cages behind her as she delivered one of her most famous speeches. We want him to hear the wail of the children who never have a chance to go to school 
but work from 10 to 11 hours a day in the textile mills of Philadelphia, weaving the carpets that he and you walk on and the curtains and clothes of the people. Mother Jones's way of speaking was gruff and her manners harsh, but people left her speeches weeping. They marched to Roosevelt's summer home. I mean, just keep that in mind as protesters get demonized for protesting in front of lawmakers' homes. Just think about that. But while the march was ultimately, um, it failed in implementing federal uh, child labor laws, uh, what it did do is uh, it became a successful way of changing the perception of workplace practices among Americans. So later, the National Child Labor Committee, which was referenced earlier, was formed uh, with the goal of continuing that, right? Promoting the rights, awareness, dignity, well-being, and education of, of children and youth as they relate to work and working. That was their um, whole objective. And so the National Child Labor Committee, organized in 1904, and state child labor committees employed flexible methods in the face of slow progress. They pioneered tactics like investigations by experts, the use of photography to spark outrage at the poor conditions of children at work, and persuasive lobbying efforts. Here's more on that. One of the first things the National Child Labor Committee did was to hire a photographer. They hired Lewis Hine, who was then their photographer for the next two decades. They sent him around the country to identify, find, and photograph children in exploitative situations. He promoted himself as a Bible salesman. He said he was bringing his camera along so he could photograph kids reading Bibles. A boy would say he was 13 when in fact he was 11, or a girl would say she was 12 when in fact she might be 9. Lewis Hines' stark photographs influenced legislation over a period of roughly 35 years. This body of work on child labor represented how he thought and how he felt that children must not be exploited. He represents the most important photographer in terms of social advocacy and social change in the first half of the 20th century. Now, the National Child Labor Committee originally focused on changing labor laws on a state level. But once they got pushback from southern states, they realized that they needed to focus on the national level. And that's exactly what they did. So uh, there was some success in passing federal laws meant to protect children in both 1916 and 1918. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, activists and labor ran into uh, the obstacle of the United States Supreme Court, which struck those regulations down as unconstitutional. The opponents of child labor sought a constitutional amendment authorizing federal child labor legislation. And guess what? It passed in 1924, though states were not keen to ratify it. There was so much pushback against it. Again, as I'm talking about these obstacles, just think about the revisionist history you heard from Learn Liberty, just nonsense. Now, it would take another 14 years of labor activity and also the Great Depression to get the federal government to act and to do so aggressively. So the Fair Labor Standards of 1938 set a national minimum wage for the first time and also a maximum number of hours for workers in interstate commerce and also placed limitations on child labor. In effect, the employment of children under 16 years of age was prohibited in manufacturing and mining. The law was then further strengthened in 1949. That's when Congress amended the child labor law to also include businesses not covered in the 1938 law, like commercial agriculture, transportation, communications, and also public utilities. Now, fast forward to where we are today, and it's really terrifying to combine the lack of labor power in America with the right wing's lust for revisionist history. And then when you think about just how persuasive 
legalized bribery is in this country. Uh, it's a little terrifying to think about the potential of these corporations lobbying our lawmakers to further loosen uh, some of the federal laws pertaining to child labor. With states moving to loosen these child labor laws, it is critical for workers to organize and unionize uh, in order to really shift the power dynamic, right, to prevent the rolling back of more of the progress that was made by workers, workers who sacrificed so much to ensure that conditions, not just for themselves, but for children and for future generations uh, would improve. And so, uh, Paul, I'd love to get your thoughts on all of this. It's it's really, it's it's scary stuff when you yeah. think about, you know, how, how far uh, capitalists are willing to go to maximize their profits and exploit people as young as 14. Right. You know, the, the last time I came on weekends, I remember your segment was about the rollback of abortion rights. And I remember saying something like, you know, it's so easy to just assume some of these gains we've made in the past will never be rolled back. Like, how could they roll back Roe v. Wade? And I think this is another example. Like, we thought, man, child labor, that that's not coming back. We're not we're never going to go back to those days. But as we're seeing, like, that cannot be assumed. And, you know, it's incredible that that Learn Liberty doofus you know he he did have a point that was based in a kernel of truth which is that you know yeah the reason for child labor is because their parents are not making enough and and sadly it, i'm sure there are many working class people and families that might be for child labor because in their eyes they're like look i need more income i need my kid to work but you know the solution is of course raising their wages and i love how he right. said the solution is economic development, which implies like just let, you know, let the corporations do their thing. It's going to work out. But no, I mean, the you know, what started happening in, in the 1930s and 40s to start waging, uh, raising wages? That was a big growth of labor unions. Um, and that's what need, needs to happen. And it's interesting you brought up the Mother Jones story in Philadelphia. Um, I, I'd written an article about one of the first general strikes in this country was in Philadelphia in the textile mills for a 10 hour day. So in the 1820s, mm -hmm. kids were working 12, 14 hours a day, and they struck just to get 10 hour a day, still child labor, but they at least have the kids working no more than 10 hours a day. Um, so, you know, that history is really important to show, like everything had to be fought for, you know, nothing was given in any sense. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's a big problem. I mean, there's a glaring solution there. Pay to an adult wage earner should make enough for their job, you know, period. If you enjoyed this video from Jacobin Weekends, please hit like and subscribe. That way, you'll enjoy all of our backlog, as well as all of our future content, including interviews, live streams, and clips. Thank you.